Okay, well, good morning, everyone. As Chris has mentioned, my name is Marty Rabinovich, and I will be talking about sex, drugs, and employment law, the topic that I'm sure you're all here to see. So my presentation will look at some of the recent cases on drug and alcohol testing, as well as sexual misconduct in the workplace. So we're going to start by looking at a 2013 Supreme Court of Canada case called CEP and uh, Irving Pulp and Paper. This is a case about random alcohol testing in the workplace, and it's a case in which the Supreme Court had to balance employees' privacy rights to perhaps not be subjected to this sort of testing versus the potential safety benefits in the workplace that could be gained by the employer as a result of doing this sort of testing. So let's look at some of the facts in Irving. Uh, first of all, this, uh, this case did involve a pulp and paper mill. So both the parties, both the union, union and the employer, did agree that uh, this workplace should be considered dangerous. So the parties were subject to a collective agreement, and there was no clause in the collective agreement which restricted having a drug and alcohol use policy in the workplace. So Irving brings in the policy, and under this policy, 10% of employees in safety-sensitive positions were to be randomly selected for unannounced breathalyzer testing. A positive test for alcohol of 0.04% or higher would attract a significant discipline, which would include uh, termination for cause, uh, the highest level of discipline. And also, if the employees refused to uh, submit to this testing, that would also amount to immediate dismissal. The policy also required testing if there was reasonable cause for the employer to suspect the employee of alcohol or other drug use in the workplace. The employee, or the employer, sorry, could also do the testing after direct involvement in a work-related accident or incident or also as part of a monitoring program for any employee returning to work following treatment for substance abuse. Now, this part of the policy was actually not being challenged in the early decision. So Mr. Pearly Day, member of the union, he was one of the 10% of the employees that was randomly selected uh, for this testing. He was in a safety sensitive position, but he had not had a drink since 1979. So you can appreciate why he perhaps wasn't so pleased that he had to undergo random alcohol testing if he had been dry for that long. Irving had eight documented incidents of alcohol consumption or impairments at the workplace over the last 15 years. No accidents, injuries, or near misses were connected to alcohol use, and in 22 months of random alcohol testing, not a single employee had tested positive. So in the Supreme Court of Canada, the arbitrator's decision was, uh, was uh, sorry, the, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld the arbitrator's decision that the policy as it pertained to random alcohol testing was unreasonable. So let's see why. Basically what the Supreme Court of Canada said was that you know, in order for these sorts of policies to, to be justified, the employer can't just say, well, you know, it's a dangerous workplace and therefore we're entitled to conduct the testing. There also has to be evidence of substance abuse in the workplace and as the court put it, there has to be a real and substantial alcohol problem at work. And in this case, the court just uh, didn't find that to be the case. Now just uh, some other comments. There is, there's a 2006 case called uh, Imperial Oil. That, oil that was decided by an arbitrator. And the arbitrator basically set out in that case that testing would be permitted if it was part of an agreed upon uh, rehab program, so if uh, there was an employee who had been struggling with uh, alcohol use and there was an agreement made 
perhaps as part of the uh, employer's duty to accommodate uh, that disability of alcoholism. If, uh, if alcohol testing was part of the rehab program, then it's okay. Secondly, if the employer thinks that uh, there's reasonable cause that someone's drunk at work, they can conduct the testing. And third, and the employer can also conduct testing after a significant accident, incident, or near miss as part of their investigation. Let's look now at uh, a 2000 case uh, from the Ontario Court of Appeal, which is uh, still very much good law today, called Entrop and Imperial Oil. And just to summarize some of the findings in this case, the Court of Appeal found that pre-employment drug testing is discriminatory, that random drug testing is unreliable and discriminatory because it cannot test an employee's current impairment. However, the court did note that a breathalyzer test would most certainly test an employee's current impairment for alcohol. The court also found that it is discriminatory to automatically terminate an employee for drug use since the employer does have a duty to accommodate and alcoholism and drug addiction will probably be considered disabilities under human rights legislation. And the court also found in this case that a positive test could just mean that an employee is a casual drug user and may not have any sort of disability or addiction uh, that would necessarily affect their ability to perform their job. So the, the Court of Appeal also found that random alcohol testing is basically discrimination at first glance, uh, but the court held that for employees in safety sensitive jobs where supervision is limited or non-existent, alcohol testing is a reasonable requirement provided the sanction for an employee testing positive is tailored to the circumstances. So basically, it can't amount to an automatic termination. If, it, if the policy says that a positive test result results in an automatic termination, that's going to be a problem and it will likely not be considered a valid policy. So some best practices here for drug and alcohol testing. Don't bother with pre-employment testing. There should be no random drug testing unless you can limit the test to current impairment and then the employer must balance privacy and safety concerns. So the employee's privacy versus safety concerns in the workplace. And there should be no random alcohol testing unless a proper balance between safety and privacy is shown. And as we saw from the uh, Supreme Court of Canada decision in Irving, the employer will have to show that alcohol in the workplace is actually a problem. Okay, let's uh, move ahead now to sexual misconduct, and we'll look at a 2013 case called the Professional Institute of Public Service of Canada and CEP. So let's go through some of the facts in this case. So we have a female cleaner employed by contractors who complained that Mr. H tried to kiss her. She pushed him away, and he grabs her buttocks, and a cleaner reported that uh, a similar incident had occurred. H uh, was regularly engaged in sexual banter. He would speak and gesture in a suggestive way. He would blow kisses. And at lunch or breaks, he would perform uh, what the court calls his sexy dance. Now, I should say, when I was reading this case, I was very curious to know what exactly this sexy dance was. But I, I, I read the case over and over again, and I, I just could not find anything beyond the sexy dance. You'll have to use your imagination. Anyway, so this sort of behavior comes to light, and the employer says, okay, I think we have to terminate it. So the case goes to arbitration. And the arbitrator does conclude that uh, Mr. H did commit sexual assault and harassment. However, the arbitrator reinstates him because in the arbitrator's opinion, a more appropriate punishment was a lengthy suspension and not termination. And his reasoning was that the complainant did not want the employee to be fired and that another cleaner was able to get H to stop when she threatened him with violence. <laughs> However, it's appealed, 
And the divisional court says, not so fast, this decision is unreasonable. And in its decision, uh, the divisional court, uh, the appellate court in this case, reasons that uh, the, the reasons relied on by the arbitrator were irrelevant and represent a dangerous step backwards in the law surrounding the treatment of sexual misconduct in the workplace. And as a side note, the fact that this conduct had been going on for about six years probably didn't help the employee too much. I'm going to uh, move on here to an Australian case. So because of this because this case was decided in Australia, it's not binding in uh, Ontario or Canada. And uh, this case is actually, uh, it arises in a slightly different context. This was actually a claim for, for workers' compensation. So the issue here, in this case, was whether the employee had sustained a workplace injury for the purpose of workers' comp. So the facts in this case, we have an Australian employee, female employee, who is uh, sent away for a weekend uh, for work-related purposes. She is staying in a hotel paid for by the employer. It's 100% work, the reason why she's away. She invites one of her, uh, her male friends over to the hotel room. They are having intercourse on the bed in the hotel room, and, and while they're doing that, a light fixture falls from above and hurts her to the point where I guess she couldn't work and makes a workman's compensation claim. So at the first level, first level decision in Australia looks at this and says, well, you know, considering the activity that you were engaged in at the time of your injury, we're pretty sure that this has absolutely nothing to do with your job. So we're not going to uh, give you benefits. But it gets appealed. And uh, the, uh, the adjudicator at the appellate level says, well, wait a minute, not so fast. What if she had just been lying in bed watching TV? What if she had just been sitting in her hotel room and she got injured? In that case, she'd probably be covered because uh, she was supposed to be away for work and you know she was staying at the hotel that was paid for by her, her company. So basically, the, uh, the, the appellate decision there said, well, I guess it doesn't really matter what she was doing at the time. She was somewhere where she was supposed to be for work and she got hurt, so she's getting compensated for this injury. Now, whether or not uh, that's going to be the state of things uh, in Ontario or Canada remains to be seen, but uh, I guess time could tell. So just to wrap up, some uh, final helpful tips here. Employers should make sure that uh, they have uh, discrimination and uh, harassment policies. If you don't have one, then uh, we can certainly help with that. Uh, the policy should set out penalties, uh, such as termination for cause for sexual harassment and assault. And finally, employers uh, should not let what may look like innocent uh, sexual banter or other potentially discriminatory comments go unaddressed. It's very important to nip these sorts of things uh, in the bud. So that concludes my presentation, and my colleague Viet will now be talking about restrictive covenants. Thank you.